and welcome to Rusty Water Towers, the podcast in search of faith and hope in rural life and ministry. I'm your host, Jonathan Lemastersmith, or as folks often call me, Dr. J. Each episode of this podcast, I talk with a guest about their experience in rural life and ministry as we search stories, examples, and images of creative faith and hope that our belie- I believe are latent in, rur- in our rural communities. My guest today is the Reverend Alan Stanton. Alan Stanton is the Executive Director of the Turner Center for Rural Vitality at the University of Tennessee Southern, where he oversees the rural economic and community development work for the university. Alan is the author of Reclaiming Rural and is the, an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. He's a native of rural North Carolina and holds degrees from Wake Forest and Duke. Alan now lives in rural Tennessee with his wife and two daughters. So we'll take some time in a moment to get to know Alan, but first, we start each week off with a country music recommendation about rural life. This week, I've really been listening to a lot of Emily Scott Robinson, and her song, Overalls, is one that'll make me tear up almost every time I listen to it. The song, the song opens, he wore overalls to meet his king, took a pack of marble reds and his wedding ring, and his 50-year-old faithful bride held his hand and walked him to the other side. He said, honey, I'm just so tired of being hooked up to 100 wires. I want to be in my own bed, call the kids around and said, it feels, he just keeps speaking to this reality of how people want to die on their own terms, who want to die with their family and friends around them in the spaces they know and love. It feels like the funerals I've been to. It feels like a life well lived. It feels like someone going out on their own terms. I think the reality of death is that death with dignity and death with hope looks different for different people. He got to go out like he wanted. He got to hold his wife's hand. It was a woman he had been with for 50 years, wearing the clothes he was comfortable in in his own beds. He even got to, if he wanted to, smoke a cigarette as he went out, because that's who he was. This is the dream of so many, but for rural people, it feels doubly so. The chorus, the chorus sings, raise a glass to my good long life. Don't dress in black. Don't let me see you cry. I'm not afraid. I'm just headed home, and it's time to let me go. This is my feeling of a country funeral. One that grieves with hope and joy. One that remembers the good, grieves the loss, and hopes for a future where we're all back together. Funerals, when well done, will likely include tears and laughter. It's something a pastor or a church member should expect whenever they're leading a funeral. And one of the crucial jobs of the church is to allow for death that honors the dying and honors God. So So often we sterilize and hide away death in hospitals or nursing homes, but traditionally, Dying at home is more comfortable for everyone. Not only that, but it allows for a space to share stories. And in the Methodist tradition, we may even accompany the, accompany them with singing. I've had friends who would get together and sing and play music as someone passed away in their community. So I highly recommend Emily Scott Robin's entire catalog, but I suggest you start with this song. And like always, I'll add this song to Rusty Water to our Rusty Water Towers playlist on Spotify. So now let's get to know our guest. Welcome to the podcast, Alan. I want you to, any experiences you've got with this song, any, any, any feelings that it evokes? So the thing I thought about first was um, my grandmother, my grandma passed away in 2020, uh, September 2020. And um, she was this like rural saint, as I call her, right? Um, so she grew up in a family of 10 or 11 kids. She was the last one alive. Um, and she grew up on a farm in the Great Depression. And her whole life was very difficult. And I remember like looking at how old she was and thinking like, why is your, why are you so frail compared to like people who have had this like, you know, much easier life. And her husband died with my parents when my mom was 12, she had three kids, put them through college on a secretary salary. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting in the nursing home, um, we put her in assistant living, assisted living by the end. And I was holding her hand the day before she died, getting ready to go back to Tennessee and we weren't really sure how much longer she would be there, but it was just me and her and her in her um, nursing room. And like, I was holding her hand and we just read, she wanted to read her favorite Psalms. Mm -hmm. And that was my my last memory was me just reading Psalms with my grandmother. We prayed together. And then she was just like, I'm so tired, Um, Mm -hmm. but I love you and goodbye. And that it was just like this really beautiful way of saying, I know my life has been good. Uh, and that, so the whole time I'm re- like listening to this song, right? Like call the kids around the bed and um, raise a glass of the good life, long life. I'm headed home and it's just time to let me go. Like it was, it really evoked that I, I was found myself back in that space with my grandma holding her hand 
um, right before she passed away. So, and I think that's true for a lot of rural families. I know like that story is not unusual for people, right? To sit and like, you have these rural saints who no one outside of that community is going to remember. But when I go back home, like she is sort of this hometown hero because she was there forever. She was such an ingrained part of the community that it doesn't matter if she was like a famous person or a wealthy person, like she is remembered as a saint in our community. Um, and there's so many people like that who outside of that town in rural places, no one's going to remember them, but man, they really are part of that, the DNA of the fabric of that community. And their death ripples through it. And it's just, I think that's one of the reasons I think an all saints day in a rural community really ripples. And, and it's really important for people uh, as part of that. And we know that people still in, in my churches will still bring pictures of people who died long ago as part of that all saints celebration. It's not just about the people who've passed this year. It's about the memories we still carry. Yeah. And I, I think it's even funny, like I have people on Facebook now, right. That I talk to, I haven't talked to them probably since I was in high school, mm -hmm. you know, 12 years ago um, or so, 10 years, 10 or 12 years ago. And even now, like I'll post pictures of my kids and their memories are like, you know, Jean would be so proud. Like your grandmother always said this yeah. about kids and mm -hmm. just like, or I have this chair that my, it was my great grandmother's chair that my grandmother had in her house. And like, it's mm -hmm. just kind of cool to see how that ripples through and people have memories about a chair. Right. And yeah. Oh, it's so real. I posted a picture of a plant that grows in my yard and my aunt came onto my Facebook and said, that was your grandmother's favorite flower and favorite plant. And I'd never met this grandmother, so I had no idea. And so it was like, I'm, I'm learning things just by posting life. And yeah. that's one of the good parts of social media. Yeah. It's well, and the other thing is like, I I've been really like, fond now of how I remember my grandma. So the, I have a lily behind me in my office, which yeah. people on um, Spotify or wherever you're listening to your podcast won't be able to see it, but it sits right behind my desk. Oh. And um, the good thing about lilies is that they're like tenacious little plants, so I can't kill it. And, and so, it'll let you know when it's thirsty because it looks like right? <laughs> And so I, it was given to me when my grandmother died. It was one of the flowers at her funeral, which is a very you know traditional thing to do down here in the South, at least. And so somebody came in and said, oh, your flower is going to die. And I'm like, nah, that's my grandma's flower. You can't kill that, mm -hmm. right? Like, Because it's just this tough thing that's going to always survive. And so whenever I see it, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's my tough grandma. Like, she's just, whatever life there is, she's got. Oh, yeah. Peace lilies will do that. It's just, yeah. and they, that is the, I feel like the quintessential Southern funeral flower. Yeah. And I guess the, the, one other thing about this song, too, is, like when I was thinking about my grandma, it's not just about my grandma's life, right? It's like about the life in the community. And the same thing, there's this latent community feel in the song um, where it's not just him and his family. It's the entirety of the community. Like the boys will all be together rolling dice and smoking cigarettes, right? Yeah. And it's like you can't, the perseverance of living in a rural life, of a well-lived life in a rural place happens in a community and it happens through these deep relationships. Yes. And so the when you celebrate that life you're not just saying goodbye to that person you're saying something about the community in which they lived as well so oh totally it's uh it's sort of like how john wesley says there's no such thing as a holy solitary there's no such thing as a rural hermit yeah because there's stories about you even if you never interact with people right you're part of that community yeah it's all it's yeah you, you can't untangle those things they're all they're all intertwined oh yes oh yes uh, well, so thank you. Thank you for sharing with your thoughts about that song. Now, let's get, take a time to get to know you a little bit. I've read your bio, but just share with uh, the listeners about yourself, where you're from, what you're about, those sort of things. Yeah, so I'm from eastern North Carolina. Um, I grew up about an hour outside of Raleigh, mm -hmm. which I say it used to be a lot more rural than it is now. Um, but my mom's family grew up in that area. So it was one of those places where um, in high school, I used to work in like the independent grocery store down the street, right? The, the IJ store. I was a bag boy, um, took people's carts out. And what was great was um, I just knew everyone from the local grocery store. So it was, I would take a block to get there. And then like my aunts and cousins and, you know, my third cousin twice removed to come in and they would be like, yeah, I remember when you were this big or whatever. <laughs> um, so I, I think one of the things about growing up in a town like that is you start to learn yourself through other people first. Yeah. And you start learn yourself through what sort of family you're in so um i push back against that a lot as a high school student as a high school student does and so like i want to nice. escape the place i remember going my freshman year at wake forest though i was sitting it was fun because my my roommate was from paris france so, like he was american but he grew up in paris and so he's like oh, i'm living in this small town in winston-salem and i'm like oh i'm in this big city in winston-salem right 
<laughs> and Winston Salem, for those who are unfamiliar, is not a huge city. Um, but it's but, still it's still pretty big compared to where I live. Yeah, right. Like it was huge compared to where I grew up. There was a movie theater there. But I remember um, my freshman year of school needing to go drive through the country during the spring. Like I, I it just didn't happen, right? Like and in high school, I was always driving through the country because that's the only way. I mean, that's you have to drive through the country. Yes, yeah, so it became heard, like just part of who you were. Right. And I just remember one day I'm like, I have got to go roll the windows down and listen to music driving aimlessly through the country. Like I just had to do it. Yeah. And that was sort of my like first coming home with my this myself as being like a rural person. Yes. So I ended up going to Duke um, for divinity school. I was a thriving rural communities fellow there um, and fell in love with rural economic development and have made my life in rural places, working with rural churches and rural community institutions to try to help our rural communities thrive in whatever way that makes sense for that particular community. So I'm very big on, you know, one rural community is one rural community and let's figure out what vitality and thriving looks like for that place. So. Oh, exactly. Uh, so for me, talking about driving out in the country uh, in college, I actually went to a place that was for college that was more rural than where I grew up. I grew up in a rural town but you could still get to the Kmart or the Walmart in 10 minutes. I would have yeah. to drive 20 minutes, either 20 to 30 minutes either direction outside of Meisenheimer to go to either Albemarle, which had a small Walmart for the first time, first bit of while I was there, or to Salisbury to the big Walmart. Uh, so it was, <laughs> you measure life based on the small, the, where you go based on the small or the big Walmart. It's so fun though, because it's like, I, so it takes about 45 minutes for me to get to Target, right? Yeah. And so things take on, uh, like you start to measure importance by, you know, how long is it going to take me to get there? And so sometimes it's like, is it worth an hour drive? Yeah, that's not that bad. An hour is not, you know, terribly long. You just um, plan I can... around it. You just do what you need to do to get there. Right. And so, um, but then sometimes you're like, do I really want to drive an hour to go pick this up? No, <laughs> like it's not worth an hour. <laughs> and that's like, it's, I, it's kind of like a 60 minute rule. Like, is it important enough for me to drive 60 minutes to get it? No, not yes or no. And then I, I, it just becomes sort of like I've some people will say like oh you must have a really hard time living in a place like that where you're not close to anything I'm like no you uh, do it. I mean you, you make a date I mean you you make a plan you go do it I, I actually spent time about a year or so ago talking with a friend who's way out middle of nowhere Pen, uh, Minnesota and was looking for a particular serial that had been discontinued but they had re-released it and we were just nerding out about finding it and we he planned a day trip to get from his place to go buy that cereal and plant some other stuff to do in the city he would be in. But it was that sense of, you know, I've got to make it worth it to go buy this cereal. Well, and the other thing too is when I lived in Durham, right? Um, so I would, I was like TAing at Duke at the time and I was pastoring a church outside of Durham. Mm -hmm. And we were, if there was no traffic, we were 10 minutes from campus. Uh -huh. um, and so by the time you like park and everything, you know, 20 minutes maybe. But when I would hit five o'clock traffic, it would take me an hour to get that 10 minute stretch home. Yeah. Right. And so even li not living in a city, I sometimes joke that people always say like, well, what's it like to drive 45 minutes to go to a target? I'm like, I mean, you probably know because you probably also drive 45 minutes to get to a target. Right. Um, yeah. Like it's not just us. It's like all of, you know, like you're driving across the city to go to a target as well. So yeah, it's just, it's, I'm just driving through country roads and can go faster and, Right. Like I'm probably speeding. I'm probably listening to a really great podcast or a really great playlist, like mm -hmm. album, like, yeah, you know. I'm not dealing with yelling at people and uh, losing my religion. No, at least not for that. Not for traffic. <laughs> <Yeah, that's, laughs> it might be for other reasons. I, I made the choice of going shopping this past Saturday uh, into Hickory, which is my closest city. And it was, it was intense. <laughs> I was like, there's a reason I go on Tuesdays at like two o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Right. Yes. So, uh, so thanks for that, uh, Alan. And so we're going to take a short break and then we're going to come back and you're going to tell us some stories and experiences you've had in rural communities. All right. We'll be back after these messages. Hey 
everyone, and uh, Alan's here with us still, and he's going to share with us. I always ask my listeners to share your stories, experiences, anything you bring from rural life that you where you see hope happening, where you see potential, and just share that with us. Yeah. Um, so I'll preface this by saying this: I work with a lot of churches on like community development things. Yes. And what I love about that work is so people think like the church is doing X, right? Like where like it becomes a program of the church. And what I love about rural communities is that the boundary between church life and like community life is not really a real boundary, right? It's permeable. It's a, it's a permeable membrane. You can go in and out of that. And they, they, right. and so there's all these things where I think about like, okay, this is a church thing, but it's actually not at all a church thing. It's just all the people from church are also part of it. Mm-hmm. And we have the idea at church and then we do it. Right. Yeah. And so um, or there's these things, these moments that we'll think about something in the community and then it like filters back into the church. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I see a lot of really natural things happening like that. But one of my favorite stories in the last several years was in the like at the height of the pandemic. So um, we have a very small hospital here with like 95 beds or so um, yeah. and a care hospital. And we kind of hit our surge and we were really worried about what was going to happen like because we're talking about overwhelming a system and we can't transfer patients out we don't have the capabilities of taking care we have six icu beds right so um several of the people that work in the hospital go to church with us the hospital um ceo at the time was uh, in the church with us several of us i serve on the board of the hospital and like he serves there and like a bunch of us are between like one or two churches and so one Friday night, we get this email where it was just sort of a, hey, pro- this weekend's probably going to be really tough. Like, just want everybody to know, um, but we're going to get through this together, right? And so one of the other board members calls me and says, I'd like to go do something for the hospital. And it wasn't anything super tangible, like, because we can't take them food. But what we did was go down to the church. Our Methodist church sits on the square here in town. And so you kind of have to drive by it if you're going through town. Oh, yeah. And- cut all the lights on in the sanctuary all weekend and they made this post about you know like wherever they're lighted like there's light darkness cannot stand and a couple of other churches started to do it too and it was sort of this all of a sudden like in the night you had all these churches lit up in solidarity with the hospital and solidarity with their healthcare workers Mm -hmm. um and really stressful weekend for them and i thought like this is what's really beautiful about living in a rural place is that we're cutting these lights on and we know the people who are there, right? And they're seeing yeah. them and thinking like, it's not just this church that's praying for me. Like it's Sarah and Alan and Jim that are praying for me and I can call them and vent to them, right? And it was this really beautiful, I think, a great way of like how our faithfulness kind of just filters into the life of the community together. So mm-hmm. it's not, it wasn't like, it wasn't anything like miraculous, right? Like there was no, you know, a hundred people got jobs or anything like that, but it was just really great like support of community, yes. support of community. So that, that's wonderful. I think that's so important. Just that reminder that figuring out how to support each other in the community does not mean it's going to be m- money or food or something like that. It's a presence that, that yeah. matters in a lot of rural spaces, a reminder that you are still part of the community, even though times are tough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, I, again, I see like my favorite stories are all these sort of like small ones. I mean, and what's crazy is I get to work on these initiatives where, you know, churches will spend lots of money to do something cool, like a literacy program. And those are great. My favorite stories, though, are like the church down about 10 minutes outside of town. Um, they're the only storm shelter for that little municipality. And I'm like, I want to say it's a town. It's not like a huge town, you know, post office school church. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're the only storm shelter, right? And we get tornadoes because we're not far from Alabama and like just geographically, yeah. we get a lot of tornadoes down there. Um, And he's like, sometimes we get one, sometimes we get 10 people, but, you know, like everyone in the community knows that we're the safe place. Mm -hmm. And just these moments where like the community depends on the church, right? And these are like, they know that the church is going to fill the, like the safe, like the social net there, like whatever gap there is, the church will step in and do it. Um, And it's not anything impressive. I mean, it's just the church being a constant presence. It exists and does the thing the church is supposed to do. And it's amazing. Yeah. It's and there's like, no way like, we can't quantify it. So like, you know, um, it's not always a great thing because, you know, denominational officials will say like, well, you're not doing a program. And I'm like, yeah, but they are <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> like this is more important. Like they're letting the community know, like we've got your back no matter what. Tornado comes through, we're your people, you know? 
yes, yeah, storms happen. We're going to figure out how to make it work. It's, it's, it's that important thing. And yeah, it's not quantifiable on any sort of denominational forms, but this is why I always recommend we need to have the stories more handy than the numbers. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you just don't worry as much about, you know, you know, worship attendance and professions of faith and worry more about what is the story and how are we continuing our community story? And, you know, how is the church involved in that? Are you a church that's really involved in that or your church that watches from a distance? Yeah. And that's more important. Yeah. I like it says something to me that in this community, I was interviewing that pastor one time and he said something like, look, in this town, you have three institutions. You have the post office, you have the elementary school and you have the church. Yeah. And literally like this Methodist church that's on the like you have to go through this town if you want to go to Huntsville. So people drive through all the time. Mm hmm. The church is right on the main street there. It's this gorgeous building. And um, it's like he said, you know, you take away the church or you take away the school, or you take away the post office, this community crumbles. And he doesn't mean that like economically it crumbles. Something about the identity of the town crumbles. Mm -hmm. Move one of those things. He's got maybe 20 or 30 in worship on Sunday morning, but yeah. like his church is a lifeblood of that community. And yeah. it's a lifeblood just because it exists. It's just present. Right. And if the school needs school supplies, they know that they can call the church to get them. And they know that it won't be like a formal program. People will just bring them to the school. And, yeah. you know, if somebody needs food, they're just going to show up at the church and the church will just have the food for them. Right. Like there's not any sort of formal program. People are just like showing up to be like, yeah, I mean, we, we're a community. We'll, we'll take care of you. Oh, it's so true. Like our churches now know that they get a phone call from the school like, oh, we need somebody to collect fruit cups for the backpack program. Great. Yeah, and it's done. It's not even like there's not a formal meeting. It's like we just announced it in church and fruit cups and applesauce and put pudding and all kinds of stuff showed up. People just went and cleared out the grocery store shelves. Yeah, because we're the church. That's what we're supposed to do. Right. And, it, you know, people I think rural churches get knocked sometimes because we don't have a ton of programs like you see churches in urban communities or suburban places are like we do 47 missions a year. Um, mm -hmm. And but rural churches will kind of be like, well, we don't do we do missions. And I remember when I was a rural church pastor like tallying up one day i finally said like all right we're gonna look at how many people individual people we have impacted over the last year mm -hmm. uh, just through random you know like okay a community needs coats so we're gonna give them coats right yeah. or um, we're gonna this place needs a place to hand out food so we're gonna be a place to hand out food or you know this hoa needs a place to meet so we're gonna let them meet in our mm -hmm. and then when something like our church of 60 had impacted like two thousand people in a year so, like tangibly interacted with two thousand people yeah and I'm like, this is like nuts. And we have no way to like, like we have to be able to tell that story in a better way other than like quantifying the number of programs because none of those were programs. They were right. all- it's, it's so important to do that because I even say that with churches. I'm like, just ask who's doing stuff. Yeah. Like, you're, you're, I'm going to assume that everyone in my church is involved. They're like, oh, we go, well, we just go visit people. I'm like, yeah, you're going to people's homes and learning about them and making sure that they don't have that, they're not dying of loneliness. Yeah, it's that reality or you're going to do yard work for a person who who's taking care of his sick wife like you're doing this is this is ministry and mission it does not have to be going to Nicaragua. It's right. just doing the things we're but I'm assuming that's just what we're supposed to do is what they're assuming. And so it doesn't count as official missions and I blame the church for that from like the late 1800s on saying missions is a very particular thing and we send money to people to do missions for us. Right. So they they realize they don't realize like, oh, oh, somebody was hungry. We they just followed Matthew 25 and <laughs> did right. things. And we don't just that we don't quite we and rural people tend to operate more in an oral culture, so it's story based, whereas suburban urban tend to have much more of that statistical bureaucratic culture that says we did these number of things. So both I think are valid ways of doing things, but the stories sure. are always more interesting to me. Yeah. Well, and it's funny, like you're talking about people going to visit people, right? Like yeah. uh, I never, when I, like, the beautiful thing about being a rural pastor is, like, you don't have, like, people tell you what's going on in the church. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and sometimes... The people, restaurant will tell you what's going on in the church. Because right. like, oh, hey, Jonathan, you know, did you know somebody sick sick? I'm like, oh, thanks. No, I had no idea. <laughs> like, thanks for telling me. <laughs> and they're like, I already took them food because they're my neighbor, right? And so I just find out about, like, everything in the community, whether they're in my parishioners or not, because of somebody in my church took them food. If I tried to make a visiting ministry as effective as that, it would die, right? <laughs> like it would, people would be like, we already do this. So why not let it organically grow? Because people are doing it because they're like, this is what I'm supposed to do as a Christian. This is what I'm supposed to do as a church person. And they're, I mean, they're just doing the ministry. Yeah. Uh, like people would pay a lot of money for their 
or like large membership churches that have that sort of community, right? Like a minister of visitation whose job it was to organize just gathering. And right. Healing. Like I never had to organize once a mill train. They just did it, right? Like it was oh, yeah. just, it was great. So yeah. It's so it, it, it's, it feels more natural. And my hope is that the generations in the rural communities that are younger still see that. Yeah. And I'm seeing that in my churches, at least. I've got younger people in my churches. We're actually this coming Sunday having a baby baptized. So that's exciting. Oh, that is. It's our second baby this year too with our church. So that's nice. Wow. Yeah, it's uh it's 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 great. This community, I think it's people still work and live in this community, but some of people do commute to Lincoln to North Carolina, Hickory, um and then so I don't think I don't have anybody that goes to Charlotte yet, but it's getting closer. Yeah. So we we struggled with this like because we had a church and I think we're starting to struggle with it a little bit now where I live, we're right between Huntsville and Nashville. Mm-hmm. And if you know the geography of Tennessee, it like Nashville's growing south and Huntsville's kind of growing north. And um, so we're gonna get hit pretty soon with, you know, what does it look like to become a suburban place? And so we're starting to get more and more commuters. But back where I was in North Carolina when I was a pastor, we had several people that commuted to Chapel Hill or Durham or Raleigh. And um, they were living outside in like our sort of geographic area. And this whole area was starting to change. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, you had people that were like, I had a guy who literally moved there in a wagon. Like, you know, he was old. (laughs) Like he moved there in a wagon. And then you had people that their farms had been annexed to become a public lake, right? Like um, one of those like good Army Corps of Engineer projects. And then you had people like their kids and grandkids that grew up there, but were like sort of in the caught in this shift, like this cultural shift. Mm-hmm. You had the newcomers who um, were trying to figure out like what it meant to live in a suburb that was still very much rural and go to a church that was still very much rural. And it was a really fun pot to mess with because you had a lot of conversations about like, what does it mean for us to be a community as a congregation and as a wider community? Um, and it, it sort of changed some of the vibe, but I, what I what I appreciated about it the most was that the younger generations still didn't like they came to see the church not as a programming place right it wasn't something that they went and took it was a place where they were gonna first and foremost find connection that was their priority mm-hmm. like and I'm like if we if that's all we do is help people find connection in a rural community we're doing good work oh, yeah. right we're doing fundamentally good work so. I mean, it feels like you, if you find a place that you can connect to and ground yourself, a lot of things will happen. Yeah. You, you, will, you will become part of that community. Oh, yeah. And then watching it take root, again, like outside of the church, right? So all these people that are making connections within our congregation are now starting to, you know, they're hanging out outside of church or they're going to volunteer together outside of church or they're, you know, they're taking care of people outside of church. Like, and it's not a formal program. It's just what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, it ha- like the church is at the center of all that so it points back to that permeability between the boundary between um yeah. church and community yes yes well is there anything else you'd like to share with us about stories i'm here for stories all day so this is what i like okay so i was in another state a uh, more agriculture state than tennessee though i'm not supposed to say that tennessee's not an agriculture state yeah. that's a different conversation for a different day um but I was in I was in the Midwest and uh, I was talking about having this really same conversation, right? What does the church do? Like, what is a rural church supposed to be doing in the community? Mm-hmm. And um, this guy was complaining, like, no one in our church will show up for a church program. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And he's like, well, we'll take care of everyone in the community, but we won't show up at the church and whenever the church has like a program. And I was like, what do you mean you show up in the community? He goes, well, listen, a couple months ago, this guy his farm got foreclosed on. So it was being set to be auctioned off. Mm -hmm. Right. And he goes, so before church, all the people found out about the auction and they went and they took up all the auction slots. So the guy buy his church back. I mean, buy his uh, farm back. Yeah. Like did this organizing before church to help the guy buy his farm back from the bank that his foreclosed on by the bank. That's amazing. Yeah. And I was like, and he's like, yeah, so they'll go do that, but they won't show up at church. And I'm like, oh my gosh. (laughs) <laughs> like, <laughs> like your church is amazing yeah, right? that is the church <laughs> yeah like let's just do that like so stop worrying about like they did a whole organizing like whole organizing thing before worship service on a sunday morning and then just did it because they love the guy and want him to keep his farm i'm like that's amazing yeah so, 
that I think that's my favorite rural story of the past, you know, several months. I, I like that story. It feels very much like how rural community organizing works. I, yeah. I run into people who are like, well, we need to do this and this and this. I'm like, how do you understand rural communities to where they're not, why would they want to come to a meeting about community organizing when they're already doing it? You just need to jump in and see what they're doing. Right. Cause it's happening. I mean, yeah, it's, it's happening. It's not formal. It's not, you know, like there's nothing, we're not going to advertise in Facebook meetings, but like, I know lots of people here who are doing really great organizing and they're not, it's not in the same political way as you talk about like urban organizing, right? Cause yes. the politics of rural Tennessee are different than they would be in Charlotte or Nashville even. Mm -hmm. But I mean, so the historically, like our community here in Tennessee, um, we're the birthplace of the KKK. Um, that's so, we got to be known for something. Yeah, got be, we're known for a lot of things, and that's um, one of them. <laughs> and so, um, but we've had several conversations about historical monuments, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, we have one of our monuments by the courthouse is this uh, soldier, Sam Davis, who was this childhood Confederate soldier who was captured and killed here, um, mm -hmm. and kind of held up as this like he refused to betray and like turn on his call, like his um his his fellow soldiers in the Confederacy, right? So um, we have a soul, we have a statue of him outside the courthouse. And obviously there was this whole conversation about removing the statue. And what was really impressive was somebody. So the conversation followed the way you might expect in a rural like Tennessee town where somebody said, let's add new memorials, not take away the old ones. And so someone took them up on that. Like we have a, a, mm -hmm. um, a, a friend of mine who lives and works here. She's a public historian. She does a lot of like local folk history things. Mm -hmm. And she said, all right, so let's let's make some more monuments. Um, so they just unveiled a new monument to, it was a group of African-American Union soldiers who were freed slaves who, after the Civil War, they were the ones that actually patrolled the streets of Pulaski. And they wow. just unveiled the memorial, right? And so she had this working group together. Like, she basically called the city council's bluff and said, like, all right, you want to have more memorials? Let's add more memorials. Um, and so she's doing all this great public history work. Mm -hmm. Is that formal organizing? No. Um, is it really cool to watch? Yeah. Is it changing our community? Community, Absolutely. Yes. And she's this great working group. I mean, it's like very conservative people, very liberal people. Like all of them are saying like, let's tell a really accurate story of what it means to be in Pulaski, one that we can be proud of mm -hmm. and point out the flaws and the, and the fallacies in our narrative, but mm -hmm. really highlight some of the strengths. And um, it's it's been really fun to watch. And that's organizing, even if it's not the same sort of formal organizing that you see in other places. Yes. And it's, it's moving the needle. Exactly. And I think also, particularly in rural spaces, the needle is going to look different and where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but because even just in terms of any of that pop political and conversational things, it's that, that reality that we need to allow for rural spaces to be who they are. Right. And as opposed to just copying the closest urban area. And that is the expectation by some people. Mm -hmm. that they will just copy the urban area or the state whichever way their state goes politically they are that so we do a rural like a regional leadership program and that's really been our focus and i think sometimes like people outside of the program have kind of questioned this right because we'll say we're going to go to a community and we're going to show you different approaches to tourism to culture to social entrepreneurship whatever it is and people will go like which one's good and i'm like there's no answer for that right like yeah. it's what is the unique thing that's happening in this rural community that makes it unique so let's not try to make tourism what it looks like in Nashville. Let's make tourism what it looks like in Giles County or Bedford County or Perry County. And that might mean like what we took a group night kayaking, right? Um, mm -hmm. in the fall village. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. I didn't get to go ahead and strap through it, but I was told it was amazing. Um, <laughs> and we'll go around to like some century farms later on and we'll look at like different ways of farming. We'll look at like more corporate farms where they're doing like massive, you know, we're trying to figure out how to make a tenderloin longer, like those kind of things. But and and we're talking about, okay, what does it mean for this to be uniquely rural? What is the trade-off? What is the benefit? How do yeah. we present who we are um, while moving forward? Yeah, that is beautiful. I, it reminds me, I don't remember his name, but he's sort of like the rural foodie, and he goes around to these rural towns and reviews, like, like it's a fancy restaurant, like diners and uh, gas station fried chicken and those sort of things, and says, you know, our places have food and things that are worth trying if you just look for it. Right. My favorite place is I, I, I'm a North Carolina barbecue fan, right? Yeah, you're Eastern uh, North Carolina. You know, I, <laughs> I prefer Eastern North Carolina. I will eat any North Carolina, but I maintain the best barbecue restaurant in North Carolina 
if you're going down 64, like you're going um, from Murphy into Tennessee, yeah. it's about 10 miles from the Tennessee, North Carolina state line. Um, it That is the best nor- barbecue restaurant in North Carolina. I don't even know the name of it. I just know 64 it. on your way to Tennessee out of Murphy. Right, which is a very rural way of describing like where something. Oh, no, that's gets. about right. You know, I, 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 yeah. so I need to look, go find this because I'm over at Hinton Rural Life Center quite often. So yeah, yeah, yeah. so I'm gonna just drive that way. <laughs> oh yeah, no, Jackie knows where it is. I guarantee it's. I mean, it's phenomenal. And it was in the Our State magazine, hole in the wall like place. Oh, those are the best. And I don't trust a barbecue restaurant that you walk into and like they don't have a roll of paper towels on the table, right? Like yeah. So I am not for. I like fine dining. It's fine. But um, I maintain that the best restaurants are hole in the walls. So, oh yeah, like oh, near my churches, uh, you know that just you talk to the person who runs the place. He's like, I intentionally, I'm not just you know cooking food. I want to create a space, and I buy the food that people like, and I serve yeah. the food that people like. So like, I he he doesn't just buy frozen chicken tenders. He knows where to get them. That make he orders his bologna from Germany. Wow. Like he gets German bologna. Like I'm just uh, and I'm just like this is rural like rural quality like he knows what his people want and he gets the good stuff oh that's great yeah I, um i'll tell you this really quick story uh, and then i'll let you go but um so we had this little diner in our town called pete's diner growing yeah. up and i used to we would go every saturday i'd sit at the counter um and i would pete was the owner right and he made this really great chili mm-hmm. like not with beans you know like the condiment chili yeah um, but on his burgers so after a while, like Pete retired, he sold the business and uh, he, the person who bought it was not the person Pete wanted to buy it. Ah. So the, he refused to give his recipes to the new owner, right? Oh, so that's it amazing. Really, it was so petty. <laughs> so, but then eventually the guy was like, I have to sell Pete's. So he sold it and it became, I think it's now called the Nashville Diner. So the original Pete calls the new owner and is like, here's how I made my chili. Here's how I made my burgers. Here's how I made my fries. Mm-hmm. Here's all the original recipes. Yeah. There's like a 10 year gap between these two events. And that guy had been sitting on these like recipes forever. And I like, he had so much pride in his food that he wanted to see it preserved. And he knew the other guy wasn't going to preserve it. So he's like, I will be paying to hold on to it for 10 years until this restaurant gets sold again. Then I'll, then I'll hand it all back over. Yes. It was amazing. That is amazing. So for those of you listening and did not know that chili was a condiment, it is. <laughs> Southern style hamburger or hot dog is chili, mustard, onion, slaw. I when I moved here, I ordered a hamburger with chili. And somebody goes, "You put beef on your hamburger?" Yes, like, yes. <laughs> it's it's and, and a hamburger is different than a cheeseburger because you'll get different things on them if you order that. You can order a hamburger with cheese, yeah, which is different than a cheeseburger. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Then my five year old orders cheeseburgers without cheese, and I'm like, "That's not a thing." That's. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that's a reality. But if she orders a hamburger, she'll get something different some places. So oh yeah, no, definitely. It's a reality. Uh, so now, thanks, thanks so much. These are great stories, and I'm going to leave all of them in. I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but now, but now, so Alan, I like to ask as we close out. I like to ask my guests to bring a piece of media that they found that's giving them hope. Whether it's a book, a movie, video game, music, whatever you have, whatever you have to share with us, just go for it. So you know, before the podcast, I was joking with you that I always like to say the Hunger Games. Yeah. I really think the Hunger Games gets a lot right about the urban rural divide. It's a good oh, totally. Picture. I live in District Twelve. The, the The houses are across the interstate from me. The way they talk about extraction economies, and I'm like, yep, um, exactly. <laughs> I will save that soapbox for another podcast and uh, spare your listeners that. Um, no, I have been listening to Noah Khan and his Stick Season album. Um, it's a great album. It's a fantastic album. Like many people. I my I have a 23 year old who works in my office and she introduced me to the um, Stick Season song several months ago. Mm-hmm. The album dropped. I listened to it, and one of the things I love about it is that he is wrestling like a lot of us do with growing up in a rural place and that desire to leave, mm-hmm. but not really know why you're leaving. And then he sort of um, demystifies rural places. I think in a way that's really healthy and takes away the nostalgia. And looks at them for like what they are and finds a really great love of rural places in that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he has this one song and it's, uh, I'm trying to remember, The View Between Villages. And the whole first half of the song is like driving away, driving away. And then the last half, he says, he passed Alger Brook Road. I'm over the bridge, a minute from home, but I feel so far from it. And then he, a few um, lines later, he says, the things that I lost here, the people I knew, 
they got me surrounded for a mile or two. The car is in reverse. I'm gripping the wheel. I'm back between villages and everything's still. And so he's like leaving and just gets pulled back in by this community that he loves. And he, other line, you know, one of them, he says, I, I want to leave, but I don't have a reason, right? Like I'm trying mm-hmm. to find a reason to leave and I just can't find one. And I don't remember the exact line of it, but I love the whole time how he's, how he's really wrestling with that um, desire to leave, but really still love for his community. And eventually I think settles into this. This is my home. This is who I am. Mm-hmm. And I'm always going to be part of this. So Noah Khan stick season. Fantastic. Great, great. I'll put a couple songs on there for you uh, on the Spotify playlist. And I'll go ahead and put the Hunger Games on my bookshelf on my website for people who want to look at that. And if you just want to come visit me, I do live in Hildebrand where they filmed the District 12 portions. And I grew up where they filmed the reaping scene. So I'm just steeped in Hunger Games uh, tours if you want them. I, I'm going to take you up on that one day. Like, right, Come on out. It'll be fun. Uh, actually, I believe uh, some of the... Um, Chip and Joanna Gaines have bought some interest in that and are remodeling some of it and going to put a nice restaurant down there. Ah. And they've somebody's already remodeled one of the houses into an Airbnb, but it's still got some of the same facade to it. They're really right now struggling with people going and stealing windows out of the old houses and things like that. So that's yeah. so they're hoping they're getting outside investors to help preserve it. Yeah. I think my favorite thing about Hunger Games is, you know, there's a lot of good like you can point to some social commentaries in it, but I think I just love that the hero of that story is unabashedly rural. Like yeah. Katniss Everdeen, like she is not trying to be urban. She looks at like she goes to cap- the capital and she's like, "This doesn't make sense to me. I want to go home." <laughs> and he's like unabashed the whole time about it. And I love it. Yes, and her rural sort of making do wherever she is, figuring out how to make her life work. Yeah, whatever that is, and not having to abandon who she, her family and who she is is just just great, great look at things. Yes, it's fantastic. So we're gonna close up here. Um, so uh, Alan, how can how can people reach you if they're interested in talking to you? So I, no one ever takes me up on this, um, but I really want people to share their rural stories, particularly if you're in a church and you have like a really great story about what your church is doing. Um, send me an email. My email is ats at utsouthern.edu. You can also hit me on Twitter at, um, at atstanton. Um, mm-hmm. It's pretty easy to remember. And, you know, if you follow me on Twitter, you should be warned that I almost exclusively tweet about rural things yes. and Wake Forest football and basketball. So um, uh, that's that's basically me too. Uh, rural things, and then Charlotte Football Club and Alabama football. Yeah, so I, I'm, that's pretty much all I do. So <laughs> feel free there, to there find me. And, and, and I think I always enjoy shooting a nice um a, a nice shift at you about JD Vance or Wendell Berry. So whenever you do something, uh, I do appreciate that. Yes, I need to be I need to be kept more grounded. Uh, so. <laughs> So, Alan, thanks for being here on Rusty Water Towers. You can listen to Rusty Water Towers wherever you get podcasts. If you have any questions, suggestions for guests or topics, or just want to say hi, you can reach out to us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, or you can email us at rustywatertowers at gmail.com. Special thanks to my wife, Shannon Lamastersmith, for writing our theme music titled Ildebrand. I record and produce this podcast because my hope is that we can lift up the beauty and faith in rural life. Thanks for listening. Live across the railroad tracks in the little white house. Let you pass if you weren't trying to find me. Many of the trees are dead, there's stumps in the ground. In a great big yard across from the fire station. Oh.